All right, well, welcome in everybody here to part three of our International Day of Light. Again, I'm your MC, Zach Yenser here, uh, enjoying today's celebration together of science and art uh, of light. Now, optics and photonics are the science and engineering of light used everywhere, every day. And Arizona is known worldwide as Optics Valley and is home to world-class businesses uh, and institutions with decades of leadership and innovation in optics, photonics, and astronomy. We'll get to meet a few more of those companies here in just a minute. Uh, we're all here today uh, in celebration of the International Day of Light, which is on May 16 every year. Uh, it's the anniversary of the first successful operation of the laser uh, in 1960. I didn't know that uh, until today, but that's why we do it on May 16th. Um, the laser is a perfect example of how a scientific discovery can yield revolutionary benefits uh, to society in communications, healthcare, and many other fields. Uh, and we'll be learning a little bit later in this session how lasers are used in smartphones. Uh, again, uh, this is just such a great experience to figure out what we're good at here uh, in Tucson, how it fits into an international celebration and storytelling that well. So thank you for uh, being with us on this journey today. Uh, before we uh, turn things over to part three of today, I want to again rep uh, uh, recognize our presenting sponsors, uh, the Flandreau Science Center and Planetarium, uh, Optics Valley, part of the Arizona Technology Council, uh, SPIE, the International Society for Optics and Photonics. Thank you to our presenting sponsors. Um, our gold sponsors today, are the University of Arizona Bio5 Institute, uh, Edmund Optics, Leonardo, PI or, or Physique Instrumente, and Viavi. Uh, we also want to take a, a moment and recognize our bronze sponsors, uh, AGM, uh, Arizona Commerce Authority, Blue Canoe Marketing, Pima Community College, uh, Tip and Tipping Point, and Wyant College of Optical Sciences. So thank you again. Uh, to a number of our bronze sponsors. We appreciate all of our sponsors for the support uh, of this event. Uh, let's take flight again uh, here to visit local optics and photonics leaders. We got to meet a, a few of them a little bit ago. Uh, part two of that is ahead. Let's learn what they do and how their work impacts our future here in Tucson and Southern Arizona. Take it away. So yeah, my name is Bob Norwood, and I'm uh, founder and chief technology officer at Norcon Technologies. So Norcon Technologies is developing optical components for infrared optics. Thermal imaging is, is an interesting area, and that touches um, uh, healthcare. Another area that's interesting is um, it's a really emerging area, and uh, 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 you, you can um, uh, see this now if you have one of the latest uh, uh, you know, handheld you know, smartphones, uh, using uh, infrared light, but not very far infrared light, for uh, what's called 3D sensing. So you know, the way the latest iPhone looks at your face is it has a, a bunch of little lasers in the phone that send their light out, and then they look at the, the, the light that scatters back from your face, and they use that information to figure out that it's you. Uh, and uh, that's just one example of a really growing area that we broadly call 3D sensing. So my name is Michael Hart. Um, and I'm the founder and currently the president of Heart Scientific Consulting. So anytime we're trying to look through uh, the air for whatever reason it might be, if you're an astronomer trying to look at a distant galaxy or a quasar, uh, it would be very nice if he could just make the atmosphere go away. Uh, and that's a little hard to do and it might have some disastrous side effects like we wouldn't be able to breathe 
Um, but fortunately, there are, there are uh, other optical methods that we can use to uh, 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 mitigate the, the degrading effects of the atmosphere on our imaging systems. And to do so, we use the, the techniques of adaptive optics, so-called. Uh, and that is what Heart's Eye is really all about. It's making blurry images sharp again. Yeah, my name is uh, Craig Ament, and I'm the founder of Arizona Thin Films, which is an optical coating manufacturer here in uh, Tucson, Arizona. Arizona Thin Films manufactures optical coatings for lenses and windows, and we do this by depositing very thin layers of material. And so, you know, how thin is thin? What do I mean by thin? Well, typically, um, the layers that we deposit are about 100 nanometers thick. And to relate that to something that you, you can understand, um, a human hair on average is about 100,000 nanometers thick. So about one thousandth of the thickness of a human hair is the size of the structure that, that we're depositing. Um, and if we design these, these thin layers correctly, we can create optically interesting films, which um, would allow us to control the amount of light that is either transmitted through the glass or reflected by that glass. Um, so that's, you know, technologically speaking, what we do. My name is Neil Brock, and I am the technology director with 4D Technology. We design and manufacture laser metrology systems. Uh, these systems are used for testing uh, primarily large optics, and these large optics are used in, uh, in, in Earth-based, space-based telescopes, uh, space probes, uh, spy satellites, Google Earth uh, imagery, all those kinds of things. And uh, uh, what we do is we can, uh, our systems will measure these surfaces so that uh, they're perfect, so they can create perfect images. The, the big programs we've been involved with over the last few years are things like the James Webb Space Telescope, which hopefully will launch later this year. Keep your fingers That's crossed. right. I forgot about it's, that, yeah. Yeah, it's, uh, it's way behind schedule, but, um, there's a lot to it. It's uh, one of the most uh, sophisticated scientific instruments ever made. And every aspect of that instrument, all of the optics, the primary mirror, the secondary, tertiary, the, the IR camera, the, uh, the structure that holds all the, uh, the mirror segments together, every one of those things are, uh, have been tested with 4D metrology equipment. I'm Tyler Steele. I'm the product manager for laser interferometer products at Zygo. Uh, that's everything laser interferometer product related from marketing to applications to um, uh, things like material sourcing and, and uh, interfacing with engineering and R&D and, and product development. Uh, so Zygo is pretty well known for, for the interferometer products and uh, I'm showing one here behind me over my right shoulder. Um, so interferometers are used to measure the, typically used to measure the surface of things like optics, like optical elements, like, uh, like this, like Edmund makes many of, uh, so, so we measure the surface, the, the instruments measure the surface of, of optics while they're being produced, um, as, as a feedback for the polishing process to understand, uh, where polishing needs to happen more or less. Uh, but they're also used to measure things like uh, uh, the imaging performance of, for instance, things like a camera lens uh, for, for wavefront performance or MTF. My name is Jerry Nairovino. I am the CEO and founder of Photonics Automation Specialties. And my job is to, of course, run the business. And I'm also uh, the lead engineer here. So I do direct um, both the day-to-day -day direction and the strategic direction of the company. Hi, my name is Jiao. So I joined Photonic Automation uh, about a year ago. 
So my main responsibility is to is for marketing and developing the business. Um, I'm also the uh, principal investigators for some of the research grants that we um, submitted and applying for. Uh, we started um, as laser test engineers, high power laser test engineers, and that's what we uh, our main uh, product for the until recently has been high power laser test equipment. Just recently, in the last year or so, we've started to get into a side business, which is now possibly becoming our main business, we'll see, uh, of environmental sensing. And this is optical sensing of environmental or uh, other uh, data. And that is also a parallel effort for us. Yeah, I would I would just say that uh, you know our new effort we're mostly focusing on um, remote sensing and uh, technologies related to that. And we uh, currently one of our big application is in the environmental side. Um, it, that would include uh, sensing of ocean um, and sensing of uh, forest and soil. Gary Sims, and I am the Chief Technical Officer and President of Spectral Instruments. I'm also the President of Spectral Instruments Imaging, another company here in Tucson. Yeah, Spectral Instruments makes electronic imaging systems used for scientific measurements. Uh, sort of equivalent to camera, you may take a picture of something with, but it's used again to make an accurate measurement, uh, typically of intensity. Um, the, the easiest uh, application to un appreciate is the uh, cameras used for astronomical imaging, uh, not for amateur astronomy, where you're looking at something to get a pretty picture of it, but of an application such as used on the Catalina Sky Survey, where you're looking for an object moving through the sky and you need to know how large it is, how fast it's moving. So I'm Andy Griffiths. I'm the CEO of the Sensor Group here in Tucson, Arizona. We're a, I don't know, 11 or 12 year old company founded in 2009. Um, to serve the interests primarily of the U.S. Navy. <clears throat> um, but what I do is uh, I'm the CEO here in, in a small company that does technology. That means what I am is a business technologist. And, and that means further that I provide both strategic and technical leadership to my company. Uh, my background is electrical engineering, which in Tucson means, um, for me anyway, we work on imaging problems that involve electro-optics or electronic devices, digitizers, and computers, always computers. So we focus primarily on the needs of the U.S. Navy for imaging solutions for problems that they encounter in mine countermeasures. Now, our part of those solutions is providing receiver technology. So a LIDAR has both um, a receiver and a transmitter. We're focused on the receiver technology for marine LIDAR systems that they use to keep our sailors safe and our sea lanes free of, of debris of things that can blow up and of course of, of anything enemies would place there to keep us from doing business that keeps us all fed and clothed and sheltered. Incredible stuff uh, and I, it's even cool for 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 me I'm learning you know, who's all here in Tucson who is 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 making this all work in our region and it's really been fun to to map around Tucson and see. So, so thank you uh, for, for putting that together. Uh, our guide for the next few minutes is gonna be Dr. Lucas Gruber, uh, Business Development Director with Leonardo. Uh, Lucas, Dr. Lucas, it's been uh, great to meet you over the last few days. And I'm gonna turn it over to you to, to, to spend the next hour with us, uh, walking us through the next presentation. Well, thank you very much, Zach. Um, I am 
here happy having eaten my chocolate that I used to measure the speed of light with in my own microwave. So I tried to, to tag along with that. And I learned a whole lot of other things like that uh, light pressure circling Bennu is very important. So who knew? Uh, makes sense, but I didn't know. So, but let me jump right away to the next thing. I would like to introduce uh, my friend, uh, Norman Hodgson. Um, we've had the, uh, uh, he actually kind of introduced me to the whole laser industry. He was the first one that hired me right out of, uh, uh, out of my um, um, research uh, ending of, for my PhD at Livermore. And I joined his group at Spectrophysics. So um, let me introduce him, Dr. Norman Hodgson. He's the vice president right now for technology and advanced research at Coherent in Santa Clara, California. That is a leading manufacturer of lasers and optics. Uh, he has more than 30 years experience in solid, lates, um, solid state lasers and fiber laser design, optimization and product development. He previously held positions, including vice president of engineering at Coherence, director of engineering at Spectrophysics, senior laser engineer and program manager at Carl Zeiss, and various university positions. He received his PhD in physics from the Technical University in Berlin in 1990. Uh, and he's co-author of books, Optical Resonators and uh, laser resonators and beam propagation, both uh, from the Springer Verlag. And he has authored more over 90 publications and conference presentations and is co-inventor on more than 35 issued and pending patents. And he is going to tell us uh, all about what kind of lasers and laser processes are used in making a cell phone, a thing that we are using every day all of us. So thank you very much, Norman. And the floor is yours. You're on mute. Norman, you're on mute. Yeah, thank you very much. Let me uh, share my screen and um, see if that works. Yeah, we can see it. There's still the square on that, there. And there's this bar probably that I have to hide. Does that work? There's still a bar in the middle. There's still a bar. Oh, how's this? Yep. Yeah. Okay, no, great. Good. So uh, thank, first of all, thank you very much for the kind introduction and also for uh, inviting me to talk about lasers. Uh, I followed the event, the event today since 1 p.m. And I have to say, I'm very impressed. Um, so thank you very much for organizing this. Uh, we had excellent presentation and demonstrations. And I have to tell you, I will, on my way home, buy a chocolate bar, and I will do the experiment with my microwave to measure the speed of light. That's something I learned today. I had no idea that you could do that. So that was really, really, really cool. <laughs> So the outline of my talk is we will talk a little bit about lasers and uh, talk how lasers work and what's special about the laser beam. Um, we will learn about everyday objects that are made using lasers. And all of you since this morning have touched at least five objects that were made with lasers. And you will see later on which ones those were. And then in the third section, we will look at the processes uh, that are used with lasers to actually make a smartphone. And there are 30 of them. It's, it's quite amazing. And once uh, you understand how small the features are in a smartphone, then you will also understand why you need a laser for this. So let's first look uh, how a laser works. So uh, the architecture of a laser is always the same. So you have a medium and the medium consists of atoms or ions and they are the, the entities that emit the light. Then you have two mirrors. One mirror is highly reflecting and the other one is partially reflecting, meaning the light can escape to the right here. But now 
the atoms will not just uh, generate light without an energy source. So you have to put energy in and we call this usually pumping. And this energy source could be light, it could be a flashlight for instance, or another laser, or it could be electricity like in a discharge, like in a fluorescent light uh, bulb that you have at home. So let's take a look how a laser action actually work in the following video. And it takes a little bit to come up here. So uh, what you will see here is how the atoms actually generate the light and how light is amplified in a laser. Uh, so here you see an atom and the electron is the big sphere here. And the electron has energy levels. And if you put energy in, you can excite the electron. And if you do it right, then light that goes in will use this energy to multiply. So you have an amplification process. And in the laser, you use this with many, many atoms. There are 100 billion times billion atoms in the laser. And whenever light hits an excited atom, it will generate another light particle. So you have an amplification process. And all the ones that are in the ground state, we call it in the ground state, they gave off the light. They will be pumped up again through the energy source. And then you let some of the light come out. And that's your laser beam. So that's very uh, the, the very principle of laser emission. And laser stands for light amplification via stimulated emission of radiation. Now, this is the first laser we learned today that May 16, 1960 is a important date. That's when the first laser actually fired, was fired uh, by Theodore, uh, Theodore Maiman. And these are the original parts. So you see here the red crystal, this is a ruby, and uh, this is the laser materials. So there's chromium atoms in there. Um, the mirrors are on the end faces of this crystal. So these are coated mirrors. The energy source is this helical flashlight. Uh, so the uh, ruby crystal is inside the center of this helix. And um, this is what it looks like here on the left when it's uh, put together. So you see the red uh, ruby crystal here, the helical flashlight. And of course, you need some electronics to fire uh, the flashlight. And this laser is still working. And sometimes they take it out of the cupboard and uh, fire it up. So uh, last time it was uh, in 2010 uh, for the 50th anniversary. So now we know how the laser works. So let's talk about power. How much power do you have in the laser beam? And it's always good to calibrate ourselves what a kilowatt is. Right? So a kilowatt of power is something like this. This is a stove and red hot. So you, you know, turn it on full um, to the max. Um, and I think we all have a feeling how hot that is. So this is a, about a kilowatt. So is the hairdryer. So the, the hot air coming out of the hairdryer is also about one kilowatt of power. So how much do lasers uh, generate? So the biggest laser ever realized does four thousand kilowatts, right? So this is uh, 4,000 times uh, the hairdryer in a beam. Now, this is a military grade laser. Uh, so in general, lasers are much lower powered, uh, especially in production of cars or smartphones. So here, for instance, if you have car welding with the laser, you have maybe up to 10 kilowatts of power. If you in, in smartphone manufacturing, it's more like 100 watts, so about a tenth of your um, blow dryer. And what do these lasers look like? So they can come in all sizes and colors. So this is a very small laser. Um, and you see here the power specification. So it's 10 milliwatts. Uh, so um, much smaller than a penny here. And then you go a little bigger. And the more uh, volume you have in a laser, the more power you usually get. So here you have 100 milliwatts. Um, if you want a 10 kilowatt laser, this is a fiber laser. It's used in, in car manufacturing for welding, for instance. So it looks like a little fridge already. 
And it, this is an infrared laser, so it has wavelengths that are uh, longer than 800 nanometers. Um, and if you go to ultraviolet, you need a little bigger laser. It's more expensive also. Uh, you see here, this is a 1.2 kilowatt uh, ultraviolet laser that uh, emits uh, UV light. So there's a lot of power, obviously, in lasers. So uh, how about the size? Right, so we can actually focus laser beams to very small sizes. Um, standard uh, process is you use a lens. Uh, maybe your beam is 10 millimeters in diameter, and then you, with, with a short focal length, you can generate a very small spot. And you can go as small as five microns, typically. Um, to give you an idea what that means, um, that's about 10 times smaller than the diameter of a human hair which is roughly 50 microns for most people. So now we have a lot of power, very small beams. And of course, um, that means we can probably remove materials and change materials. Now to give you an example, um, what you can do, this is a microscope picture, uh, electron microscope picture of an eczema uh, laser ablating on a human hair. So it, basically remove material uh, on a human hair, writing the word eczema laser. So this is how powerful laser technology is uh, in terms of uh, size and, and, and power. Now we have a combination of high power, very small beam size, so we can remove materials. So let's take uh, two uh, movies here. And I'll start with the left one just to show you what you can do when you uh, cut metal. Uh, so this is a uh, maybe 500 watt laser and it's focused onto an aluminum bar, as you can see, and this is all in real time. So you can cut out the metal. There's also gas flowing here through this nozzle to remove the material <clears throat> uh, as soon as it's melt, uh, melted. Uh, on the right, you will see, um, hole drilling and the laser beam comes from the top. And there are two mirrors that move very quickly to guide the beam in different directions. And you will see uh, how a whole area of holes are drilled in this aluminum piece. So this is again, real time. Um, so the laser is switched on and off between holes and uh, the beam is moved uh, you know, along this direction and also around the perimeter of um, the hole. Now we can also weld and mark. So here's car welding as an example. So you see this is actually a standard process in car manufacturing. Most of the cars are welded with lasers. So you see how parts are uh, welded here with a robot. Uh, there's a focusing lens in here. There's two mirrors again to move the beam. And you can move the robot as we will see in a minute or in a second, there you go, to get around the corner. And we can also do other nice things like laser marking. Uh, there's another video. So here you are, have the beam from the top. You have the beam goes on and off and with mirrors it's moved. And you can uh, write uh, zero numbers on you know, uh, IC circuits. You can make passport pictures, this is an real-time image of a laser making a passport picture. Um, here's a real-time image of marking um, with the laser. Again, the laser beam is moved with mirrors and is switched on and off. And this is how your keyboard is made. Um, it's blank, uh, it's all empty, and then the laser beam goes along and uh, gives you all the letters and, and symbols. So many everyday objects are actually made using lasers. So um, marking is a big, big area. So whenever you buy a battery or a Coke can, uh, you see here a, a lemon uh, with writings on it. Um, your windshield wiper explanation how to use it. For instance, if you have a tool and it has a barcode on it, if you buy a bottle and it has um, 
dates or manufacturing information on the side. That's all done with lasers and, of course, your keyboard. So many, many things uh, are touched by lasers. Anything you open and it's easy to open, uh, that means a laser has made little holes to help you open the package. Leather is cut with lasers. Um, if you buy a leather shoe, it's very likely that uh, all the leather was cut with a laser. Um, even postcards are cut with lasers, right? So if you have a very um, detailed cutout in a, in a postcard or in a, in a birthday card, um, it's usually a, 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 what we call a laser printer. So you have a laser somewhere and it cuts out uh, the area from the paper. And then of course, like car manufacturing, many, many areas, it's not just welding, it's also cutting the airbag, uh, making holes in injector nozzles, um, uh, cutting the rear view mirror that's done with a laser, for instance. Um, so many, many things uh, are touched by lasers. And a laser can also make you look younger um, and this is one of the processes that uh, are laser based. It's called fractional laser resurfacing. And what I see here on the left is a lady and she had the, the treatment. Uh, it comes with several sessions, but you see three months after the, the laser treatment, uh, the wrinkles are basically gone. And how does that work? Um, you make little holes. Uh, so it's kind of material processing. So you make a whole area, area um, of, of little holes. They're one millimeter deep and maybe uh, 1.1 to 0.3 millimeter in diameter. And the healing process actually activates the collagen. So the collagen contracts and it pulls the skin together. Um, you see here a picture of the actual process. So you see here the two-dimensional hole pattern. Um, you get local anesthesia for this, of course, and uh, typically you feel like you had a sunburn the next day, and then the healing process takes uh, several months and it will renew your skin. So all very wonderful things. All right, so let's uh, talk uh, about the smartphone. Um, so what do we do with lasers to make smartphones? And um, before we get into this, let's first look how many smartphones are actually made every year. And um, if you look that up, you can Google that, of course. Um, so in 2020, it was 1.3 billion uh, smartphones that were shipped. And the market is relatively flat for the last couple of years. So it uh, fluctuates between 1.3 and 1.5 billion. And that's a big number, but it, it becomes really big if you uh, calculate how many smartphones is that per second, right? And per second, that means there are 41 phones every second being made in the world and shipped, right? That's, it's quite amazing, right? If you count it, it's 41, 81, 82, 122. So this is how phones are shipped uh, in the world. And if you look uh, who's shipping those, um, it's always nice to remind ourselves there are many, many suppliers, right? So we don't want to just talk about Samsung or an iPhone. So there are, Samsung is certainly the number one in terms of um, units being shipped, but there's also other suppliers uh, as you can see here. So this is a quarterly uh, shipment here in last year. So let's take a look uh, what's inside a smartphone. And here you see an iPhone actually taking apart. And you see there's eight modules roughly. Uh, so we have uh, here in the center, this is the, the main PCB. So you have the microprocessor. So there's a lot of uh, logic uh, components, memory components in there. We would get into this. Um, you have, of course, the case. You have the display module on top and the battery. And then many other. Uh, parts like uh, the camera module and sensor, um, and also the fingerprint sensor and the home button. And all of those need lasers to make them. And all these lines here that you see in black are laser processes that are required to make all these components. So there are about 30 of them. 
And we will not go through all 30. We will just take the probably 10 most important ones that are really also very interesting to, to people when you explain them. Uh, so we will start uh, with the microprocessor as the first component. So we start uh, with the fundamental building blocks of the phone. So the case comes at the end, the display comes at the end. What's first is we have to make a processor. So this is a processor. It's on the main uh, board uh, inside your phone. This is an A14 processor on the, on, in the photo. Uh, it's in your iPhone 12. It has 12 billion transistors, all right? That's a big number. So a transistor is basically a switch. And these transistors are all connected uh, inside the processor. And whatever you do in the phone, it gets controlled through this processor. And the area is very small. So it's like your pinky. If you take your pinky uh, fingernail, that's about 100 square millimeters. Um, so you have 12 billion of them. And each of these transistors is very small. It's a factor 1,000 smaller than your diameter of the hair. And this is the switch, right? So you put some signal here, and then you can switch current from left to right. And just imagine there are 12 billion of them, and they're all connected in very complicated ways. And the way to build those is you put them, uh, you, you coat layers on a silicon wafer, and you have 160 roughly processes to build a, a microprocessor layer by layer. And again, you need about 1,000 of these next to each other, and then you're as thick as a human hair. So, so the feature size is unbelievably small. Right? So it's uh, quite amazing uh, that this can actually be built. And this is a, a silicon wafer with processors once they are done. And this is what it looks like. And if you take a cut through this, uh, you will see there's many, many layers, and the feature size is very, very small. So if you take this red bar in this picture, you have to multiply the length of the byte by a factor of 10, and then you get uh, the, the thickness of a hair or diameter of a hair. Right? So, so you have very, very small features that you grow on a piece of silicon. And there's a challenge, right? Because we have dirt uh, in the air, we have dirt around us, uh, the dirt can be very, very small, and you can't have that on these wafers. So the first process uh, that is done in microelectronics for anything you buy is an inspection of your silicon wafer. So you have to find all the defects and the dirt um, that's on that wafer, it's about 12 inch diameter, and you need to know what it is, how big it is, and where it is, and as fast as possible. And the challenge is that these defects are very, very small. They can be 5,000 times smaller than the diameter of your human hair, and you still need to find it. Because if you grow a transistor on top of this dirt, you will have a defect. You cannot use that part. And what uh, we do is we have a laser tool for that. So there are companies that make wafer inspection tools and you have a focused laser beam. The laser beam moves in and out over the rotating silicon wafer. So it would rotates very, very fast. Whenever a defect is hit by the beam, there is light reflected and scattered and you can detect that. And based on the detection, um, there are many, many detectors There can be you know, 64 detectors. Um, they are distributed on a, on a half sphere. Uh, based on the signal of each detector, you can calculate back uh, what is it, uh, where is it, how big is it, and you can make a map and you know exactly where the dirt is. And the lasers that are used here are ultraviolet lasers, and that's because ultraviolet light gets scattered more. That's why our sky is red in the evening, because all the blue and the ultraviolet light uh, gets scattered away by the, by the sun, uh, by, by the, the atmosphere. Sorry. 
So this is all done within one minute. And this is what the tool looks like. So the wafers go here uh, in a cassette from the right and they get automatically fed into uh, the tool. And then one minute later, uh, you get a map of your, um, of, the, of your silicon wafer. And the map tells you where you had some dirt. And you will not clean the wafer. All you do is you know after you're done growing your microprocessor, you have to throw these away, right? That's basically the whole logic behind this. Now, I tried to explain that to my mom a couple of years ago, and she was not impressed that this is so cool. So I came up with a little trick. And the trick is, let's visualize this in a bigger scale. So here's our problem. We have a defect on a 30 centimeter wafer that's 12 inches. And the defect is about 2,000 times, 3,000 times less than the diameter of a hair. And we need to detect it, what it is, where it is, and all within a minute. So let's uh, blow this whole thing up here, magnify it 100,000 times. And then if you multiply 20 nanometers with 100,000, you get two millimeters. We can deal with that. That looks like an ant, basically. Your 30 centimeter wafer is now 30 kilometers in diameter, but that's 18.6 miles. And your laser is not 10 centimeters above uh, the, the, the wafer, but 30,000 feet. So it's kind of like a plane. So now we have to find that two millimeter defect in one minute. And let's uh, look at Tucson. All right, so this is the map of Tucson. This is our wafer now, right? It has 18.6 miles diameter. So it gives you an idea what the, uh, the magnitude of the problem is. And you need to find two millimeter defects here in a minute and all of them. So basically, since you can't rotate Tucson uh, very fast, so you have to circle uh, basically with a missile or rocket over Tucson at 30,000 feet and Mach 10, uh, you spiral around you focus a beam down onto Tucson, scan it. You find all ants in less than one minute, and you know what the ant species is. So that's wafer inspection. And that was the point where my mom uh, dropped her jaw, basically, because uh, that's pretty amazing, you know, that a laser can do this. So this is just, if you, if you think about it, so cool that there's technology that can actually do this. Now, once you're... Wafer is grown, so you, you grow your processor on the wafer. That's a couple of weeks of uh, coding and lapping and structuring. Uh, then you have to cut the processes um, by cutting the, the silicon wafer. Uh, the standard process is having a diamond saw that rotates. You see this here. And you basically cut lines and then cut lines across. The problem is um, you can't do this very fast if the wafer is very thin. And nowadays, wafers are as thin as a human hair. They are around in this region. And you see how uh, what's shown here is the speed uh, of the cutting blade. And you see when you have a saw, you have to slow down. Otherwise, you break uh, the edges of the cut. But you can use a laser instead. And with the laser, the thinner the material, the faster you can actually cut because you have to remove much less materials, of course. So you see what happens uh, if you do this with the laser, you have a beautiful edge. And with the saw, you would see some very ugly uh, edges here uh, because you do it too fast. So more and more lasers are used um, in this process uh, to actually cut the, the processes or, or cut the, the wafer itself. So we got our processor done now, and there's not only one wafer inspection uh, process. There are many of them during the growth process. And uh, the next part is the printed circuit board. So printed circuit boards nowadays are multi-layered. So they look like this. So they have many copper layers and insulators uh, in between, and they need holes. And the holes are there to connect these different layers. So you drill the hole 
you coat it with gold, and then you have an electrical connection. And these are called via holes. And the via holes are very small. Again, diameter of a human hair or smaller. And in every smartphone, there are 20,000 to 100,000 of these holes. And they have to be drilled. Um, the bigger ones get drilled mechanically uh, with uh, diamond drills. Uh, the smaller ones are done with the laser. And I show you now a video where a laser is actually drilling these holes. And this is slow motion. So this is copper and the holes are about the diameter of a, of a human hair. Um, so it would take a long time to make 100,000 holes this way. So this is not how fast uh, the real process is. It's just a demonstration. So in real time, you make 5,000 per second. And they are not organized in a nice matrix, uh, two-dimensional array. They are all over the place. So you have to move your laser beam back and forth constantly and come up with the fastest way to cover all these holes in the shortest time. <clears throat> and there are companies, mostly in Asia, uh, they make tools. These are via drilling tools. And you see here a factory. They make printed circuit boards and you have you can see here, these are Hitachi tools. So they have lasers in there and they make these via holes. And these factories run 24 seven. So constantly production. And this is one hallway. There are 12 more next to it right, to give you the, the size of this. So they're constantly drilling holes nonstop in many, with many, many, many tools per factory. So once your microprocessor is done um, and you have it on your board, these boards are usually made in, as panels. So there are many, many boards on one panel. So you have to cut uh, the individual boards out of the panel. That's also done with laser, again, with an ultraviolet laser uh, that has to do with the absorption of the material. So some processes want infrared lasers, some need green, some need ultraviolet. So it depends on the material, which laser you use. So and this is an, an iPhone or smartphone uh, printed circuit board uh, after it's cut out. And then, of course, you have markings uh, on the processor that's done with lasers. Um, so the laser would look like this. It's, again, an ultraviolet laser. Um, or you do two-dimensional coding, a barcode uh, on the circuit board, so you know when it was manufactured, uh, and what the batch number is, for instance. So all these things uh, are done with lasers. And um, so let's talk about the display now. So most computers, so your laptop for sure in front of you, uh, has something that's called a liquid crystal display, or LCD. So let's take a look how this works. So you see this here on the left side. So you first generate white light, right? And how this is done, we will talk about that in a minute. So the white light goes to the left here in front, and it first goes to a polarizer, uh, which means that only light that, can, that oscillates up and down can pass uh, this element. And then you have a second polarizer, which is perpendicular to the first one. So if you don't do anything, uh, so it oscillates like this, and then it needs to oscillate horizontally to get through this one. So if you don't do anything, it gets blocked here. So you have no light coming out. And what you do, you rotate the, the oscillation direction with a liquid crystal. And in order to ha make this happen, you have to apply a voltage. And this is done with a transistor. That's the switch that applies the voltage in each pixel to rotate the white light so it can pass the second polarizer. And if you switch off the voltage, then you have black here. So you, have, you don't see any light. And of course, you have a color filter to get red, green, and blue. So you can actually see color. Uh, from each pixel. So now each pixel has three colors. 
Um, and the size is typically the size of a human hair again, right? 50 microns, 30 microns, something like this. So it's very, very tiny. And there are millions of them on your display. So the question is, how do I get the white light? Right? It's called backlight. <clears throat> and the backlight uh, on most phones and many, many computers, uh, the, most computers actually, uh, they are white LEDs and they are on the side. So if you look at your laptop in front, you will see there is, it's not all screen, right? So you have some areas behind plastic on top and at the bottom, that's where the white LEDs are housed. That's, and now the white LEDs actually shine along the direction of the display. It's, that's not what we want. We, want. we don't want white light shining in this direction. We want to shine it in the opposite direction. Uh, perpendicular to see it in your eyes. And what you need is something that deflects the light. And there's again a laser process. And the back, it's called the, the LCD backlight unit. So you have the LEDs here. And the light goes through a sheet of plastic, basically, and you make little bumps. And you see here the bumps uh, shown here, and they are made with a laser. Uh, you basically melt the material. And there are smart people that figure out where the bumps have to go so that your whole screen has perfect white with the same brightness everywhere. So you need more bumps uh, near the LED, uh, less bumps near the LEDs and more bumps in the centers. But um, that's somebody, or there's uh, engineers that figure that out, how to do this. And then the laser takes care of the rest and makes these bumps according to the recipe. So that was LCD. So there's another technology, it's called OLED. And this has become more popular in recent years. And the reason is you don't need backlight anymore. And it makes it all so much simpler. And you see what happens is instead of having a liquid crystal that rotates the light oscillation direction, you make each pixel a light source. And so you have organic, LEDs, so these are organic materials. Uh, you still need voltage to run the LED, of course, so you still have transistors in the back, but you don't have white LEDs anymore. You don't have a backlight unit, so you have less uh, planes here to deal with. In addition, if you don't apply voltage to one of these LEDs, it gets dark. And in dark means it is pitch black. On an LCD display, you never get pitch black because you always have leakage between the cross polarizers. They are never completely perfect. So what happens is these LEDs are brighter. They have better contrast. So black is really, really black, right? And all Samsung phones have OLED displays, iPhone 12, uh, the Pixel and Xiaomi, uh, phones. So this is an emergent technology. <clears throat> more and more people use this um, because you get brighter displays and uh, you have better contrast. So no matter what you do, LCD or OLED, they have one thing in common. They need switches. They need a plane of transistors. These transistors, again, are very small, uh, micron size or less, uh, so a thousand times less than a hair. And they switch the voltage to activate either the light source here, which is the LED, or they activate the crystal to rotate the, 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 the oscillation direction of the light. And these TFTs are grown, they are coded in layers on top of silicon uh, coated glass. And you have to do something with the silicon to make this actually work. And it, of course, takes again a laser. And this is called laser annealing. So what happens is, so you, what you see here is glass and you put silicon on top of it. And this is a coating process and as a result, you get what's called amorphous silicon. So these are not crystals. It's like sand, basically. Right? 
on, a, on an atomic level. It's about 50 nanometers um, thick. Uh, so again, factor 1,000 less than your hair. But now you need a laser, and you move the substrate underneath the laser beam. And it's an ultraviolet laser that gets focused uh, on top of the substrate. You move with about 10 millimeters per second. And on the other side, what you get is little crystals. Right? So these crystals, um, what it means is the atoms are actually in a regular pattern. And this has um, many advantages in terms, in terms of how the electrons move now through this display. And that's shown here. So what happens is uh, you, can, you can think of it uh, like this. So these little mannequins here, these are the electrons. And if you have amorphous silicon, they have a hard time moving along. Um, and if you anneal, which means you make little crystals with the laser beam, um, they have a much better time. They're actually 200 times faster. It's called electron mobility. You, you gain a factor 200. So if electrons move much faster, that also means if you think about a cable, you have less resistance. So you can make the cable smaller and smaller. And the cable is actually the transistor. And if you have a small transistor, you can make a small pixel. So, so this process enables to make the pixels smaller and smaller. And nowadays, uh, standard is about 800 pixels per inch. And you also get more battery life because you have less resistance for the electrons, right? So you have a, a double win here, resolution and battery life. So that's why this process is very important and it uh, is used for both LCD and also OLED displays. And that's the tool that does this. And um, this, uh, the glass substrates, they are a couple of meters uh, long and about 1.7 meters wide. So they get pushed through here. Uh, there are three lasers. Here, as you can see, these are the black boxes there. And uh, this whole tool here makes a line with the laser beam. So the line is one and a half meters long and about 400 microns wide, uh, which is about roughly eight, eight hairs, eight, eight diameters of a hair wide. And <clears throat> you push the substrate through this focused UV light to generate these little crystals. So what's really cool about OLED displays is that they can uh, be bendable. And that's because they're thinner, right? So they don't have the polarizers that you need, these two polarizers. They don't have the backlight unit, remember, with the white LEDs. Uh, so you have less uh, layers. And if you have less layers, uh, you, then you can start bending your display. And you see this here in the picture. Uh, this is a bendable OLED display. You see also probably very nice contrast and, and very bright. And then, of course, you can make flexible uh, OLED uh, displays in various forms. You can, for instance, here's an a wristband with a, with a display, or you have a foldable phone, so you can buy those already. Uh, you can put a display on a round tube, for instance. Uh, you can put it in inside uh, of a car window, for instance, or in a helmet uh, that you wear. So it opens up a lot of uh, new areas, of course, uh, for display technology. Um, <clears throat> and so how is that done? So like other displays, you start growing it on glass. So that's very standard. Uh, so you have all these OLED layers. So the, the OLED layer is the red one. This is the, the active material and the TFT array. Uh, these are the transistors. And uh, you also have a polarizer. But now you have to remove it from the glass. And it's, there's, a, again, a laser process to do that. It's called laser liftoff. 
So you come in with the ultraviolet laser, pulsed laser, so it makes little light pulses. Um, you get absorb at the interface between the glass and the first layer, and as a result, it lifts off. So you move the beam across here, and then your display will detach from the glass, and now you have a bendable display. All right, so let's take a look at something else that you need for your display. It needs to know where your finger is, right? So we all use our fingers to you know, open it up. Um, how does actually the microprocessor know where your finger is? And it knows that because there's something on top of uh, a glass, which is indium tin oxide. It's a layer, and this layer is transparent but it's also electrically conductive. So there's not many materials that are transparent and conduct electricity. If you think of about electricity, it's usually copper that comes to mind. So it's opaque, obviously, but indium tin oxide is actually transparent. So what you do is you have two glass pieces here. So this is the display. And what you do is you make lines with indium tin oxide in one direction. And then on the second level here, you make them in the perpendicular direction. So you have a cross pattern of lines. And if you put your finger here, you will change the capacitance at that cross section of two lines and you can sense that. So this is how we know where your finger is. And how does the ITO get there? Well, you coat the glass again, and then you use a laser to remove materials in straight lines, basically. So this is so anything that is not yellow here was removed with the laser on the left side. We use a UV laser for this uh, with about uh, 30 watts. It's a pulsed laser. Yeah, and then it goes on to the outer area. So your camera lens is cut with a laser. This is sapphire, typically very hard material. Second hardest after diamond. And since it has to be round or it has round edges, very hard to do this mechanically. Uh, so you need a laser for this. Uh, this is an infrared laser, typically with 50 watts. Um, the hole uh, in your phone was cut with a laser for the home button, home and, uh, home button and fingerprint sensor. Um, so there's also the window here of your home button on the older phones, of course, you have that still. That's also sapphire and it's cut out uh, with a laser <clears throat> infrared. Um, if you have a, a watch, then the cover glass is typically a sapphire window. And that's cut with the laser. And on many tablets, not on phones, but on tablets, uh, the laser, uh, the front of the tablet, the glass is cut with uh, CO2 lasers. Um, so you see here some examples of laser cut uh, glass. And if you have an iPad and you see some black letters on the back, they are all done with lasers. So this is all written uh, with the uh, infrared lasers, about 50 watts. Yeah, and this is my, uh, let's say, favorite process. This is the last laser process in the life of an iPhone. And what you see here is how uh, iPhones get destroyed at the end of life. So when, whenever you give back your iPhone to get a new ones and you trade in, or then uh, in some cases, uh, you it will end up in a machine like this to make sure it's really destroyed. And what you will see here is um, a kilowatt laser. Um, there's a robot and it picks up the phone and it will drill a hole. And the hole is exactly where the microprocessor is. And this is... Yes, that's what the that's the last process uh, that's in smartphone manufacturing, obviously, and that's also the last slide. So thank you very much for your attention. I hope you had a, a good time, despite of being a little long. Um, 
and hopefully I gave you a little uh, feeling uh, how important lasers are in life and also maybe you have you're feeling some enthusiasm about the technology. So thank you very much. Well, thank you very much, Norman. This is a, a great presentation. So I hope that um, that people uh, are getting an impression or got an impression of how many different processes are there are there are being used in these um, uh, in this manufacturing. Um, so there's a few questions that came in already. So um, let me start out with the first one. So why are there uh, why are diff the different powered lasers usually different colors? Yeah, so th th there's uh, different uh, answers to this. So the first one is the longer the wavelengths, the easier it is to make power, right? So if you go shorter and shorter in wavelengths, you usually get less and less power. And that's because it's much easier to make the, the light amplification process with a long wavelength than it is, for instance, with ultraviolet light or green light. Right? That's, that's one answer for this. Okay. So, yeah. All right. Thank you. Uh, now, um, this one, all the first three, they came in fairly early on. So yeah. that refers to the first part. So is a laser weld stronger than a solder weld? It can be, I mean, it can, it's certainly the same uh, quality and in, in many cases it's actually better because you have more control over the welding process. You can also, for instance, there's a new technology, it's called adjusted ring mode welding. So you have a, a center beam and you have a ring of beam and you move along and it turns out that it's actually much better weld quality than if you did it by hand. So, so if you have the right process, it can be even better than just uh, normal welding. All right. And then there's one, uh, one person that uh, clearly, and so did I actually, um, uh, kind of hone in on the, on the lemon. How do, you, um, how do you laser a lemon? What makes the marks? <laughs> <laughs> oh, you laser a lemon. It's very simple. So you have a conveyor belt with lemons, right? And there are several lasers on top, and they detect when their lemon comes by, and then they basically have two mirrors that move very quickly, and they right away, as soon as they catch the lemon, they write they write it on to, on top of it. It's a very fast process. So the, the the marking itself is done in milliseconds, right? So the the lemon doesn't even move during that time. So you so you can you can push through many many lemons and you know hundreds thousands a minute and still if you have four or five lasers they catch them all. Fascinating. And what what kind of lasers are used for that? Uh, anything that has to do with biological material like lemons, leather, uh, paper. Uh, it's always a CO two laser, right? Also uh, whatever your bottle, your if you if you have a your water bottle and it has mm -hmm. some black uh, date on it, coat. that's a yeah. CO2 laser. Um, Got it. All right. So there's actually a funny story about this, so about marking. So um, there's, I think it was in Japan, where it's a company, they make um, basically marks on, on chicken eggs, right? And it's a two-dimensional pattern and it's done with laser. And if you scan this with your phone, you will get a picture of the hand that laid the egg. <laughs> Something we always wanted. <laughs> Personal connection to your breakfast. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So you know who it was, yeah, who laid the egg. <laughs> um, now, I think we have a couple more. So how do they get the transistors so small? Yeah, so this is done with uh, imaging, right? So you have... Um, uh, so the, the size is roughly nowadays 10, 12 nanometers uh, of, of your resolution. And you have a big, big mask. And it's an imaging process and a big tool to get down to this. So if you do imaging, you don't have the resolution limitation of diffraction. Right? 
So you can go down to 10 nanometer scale. And then you have a pattern of UV light and you put a resin on top of the wafer. And wherever the UV light hits, it gets hard. And then you etch away the rest later. And that's how you get these 10 nanometer feature sites. And you repeat this about 100 times. It's a six week process. So you, you code, you put resin on, you put UV light through a, a, a mask and so on and so on. And in between you do wafer inspection. And then after six weeks, uh, you have a big uh, 12 inch wafer with a lot of microprocessors. And nowadays, I think the, the technology moved to five nanometers. I, I just read uh, Intel, they, they made their first five nanometer transistors. Wow. Um, so it gets smaller and even, smaller. Even um, more powerful. 30 years ago, uh, transistors were microns, and now it's uh, nanometers. And, uh, yeah. You know, so five years ago, an iPhone 6 had 2 billion transistors in, in a fingernail. Now we have 12 billion transistors in a fingernail. So, so it moves. Uh, there's a law. Yeah. It's, it's called Moore's law. So every uh, every one and a half years, the size of transistors collapses by a factor two. Mm -hmm. And without laser, nothing works, as we know, right? Yeah. So <laughs> now, now there's one person is um, uh, is curious about the supply of silicone. Is it possible we will run out of silicone or any of the other materials used for the chips? Yeah, so, so the good news is silicon is the same as sand, basically. So it's SiO2, uh, that's where it comes from. And you grow it uh, based on that material. So you make uh, ingots. So these are big uh, you know, silver looking uh, pools. So there is enough material, absolutely. All right. I think we are just about uh, done. So thank you very much, Norman, for thank you. Um, pleasure. for giving uh, giving us the time and uh, and giving this uh, very interesting presentation. Um, so at this point, I would like to uh, thank the presenting sponsors. Um, that is the Flandro Science Center and Planetarium the um, Optics Valley that is part of the Arizona Technology Council and SPIE, the International Society for Optics and Photonics. Um, as well, uh, I would like to thank the gold sponsors, which um, is the University of Arizona Bio5 Institute, um, Edmund Optics, Leonardo, PI, and Viavi. And with this, I would like to uh, give the floor back to Zach, to Zach Yenzer. Dr. Gruber, thank you. And Norman, thank you as well. Great presentation. Uh, before we go to a brief intermission, uh, would like to also take a moment and recognize uh, our bronze sponsors as well. Uh, if Shiloh can uh, throw that slide up, want to give our bronze sponsors some love, and then we will uh, go to break. And of course, those are 4D technology, uh, Add Value Photonics, Commercial Real Estate Group, Connect Tucson, Control Vision, uh, Global Super Abrasives, Habitat for Humanity Tucson, PADT, Pima JTED, Ruta Cardinal, the Town of Sawarita, the Sensor Group, Spectral Instruments, Tech Launch Arizona, and Tech Parks Arizona. So we want to thank our bronze sponsors uh, for this event today. All right, we're going to take five minutes. Shiloh is going to spin us away uh, to our final break. Uh, please do come back at five o'clock uh, for part four, our last part of this celebration of the International Day of Light. We'll see you back in five. Welcome to Arizona's Optics Valley. 
Optics and photonics are the science, engineering, and application of light used everywhere, every day. Arizona is home to world-class institutions and companies in optics, photonics, and astronomy. The industry has a $4 billion economic impact in Arizona. Optics Valley is the industry association that helps companies thrive through business acceleration, workforce development, and startup support, and connects Arizona companies to local and worldwide opportunities. The Optics Valley ecosystem supports strategic initiatives for innovation, growth, workforce development, and networking. Learn more about Optics Valley, where optics, photonics, and astronomy connect and grow.
All right, well, welcome back to uh, part four of our International Day of Light. I'm your MC, Zach Yenser, and again, it has uh, been a privilege and an honor to be with you today as we have celebrated science uh, and the art of light uh, this afternoon, uh, Sunday, May 16th. Optics and photonics are the science and engineering of light used everywhere every day. Uh, and Arizona is known worldwide as Optics Valley uh, and is home to world-class businesses and institutions with decades of leadership and innovation in optics, photonics, and astronomy. And as you can probably hear, like many of you, been spending this time with my family at home. Um, we're gonna go, hold on one sec. <laughs> Thank you as we, uh, as we figured that out. We're gonna go and visit uh, our final set of local optics and photonics leaders uh, and celebrate what they do and how their work impacts our future. But real quick before Shiloh runs that, I wanna give a special shout out to three people who made that happen. Olivia Felberg, Lucas Gruber, and Melissa Goodrich at Habitat for Humanity conducted all those interviews and produced this video. So let's go visit some more of the amazing people and organizations uh, that are making the local optics and photonics sector uh, what it is here in Tucson. Thanks, Shiloh. So now that we've met everyone, why don't we learn a bit about why Tucson is so special to optics? Um, but overall, you know, Tucson and Arizona in general are just ideal places to do business. And I think you're kind of seeing that with uh, a lot of companies moving here lately. So, We would like to believe that the, the growth that we've seen in the company in the, last, uh, in the last few years will continue and that we'll continue to provide, uh, you know, meaningful employment for uh, optical and mechanical engineers coming out of U of A or potentially coming uh, from elsewhere. My colleague here, um, Professor Pagan Berrien at the University of Arizona, so I'm also a professor at the University of Arizona, just called me out of the blue of late one December day when I was working on, you know, the basic asset sale of the company to myself. <laughs> and and, um, and uh, said, hey, you ever think about being a professor? And I said, well, yeah, maybe about 20 years from now. I mean, I, was, I really wasn't thinking about being a professor. I did have a long-term plan. So I came down here and I really loved uh, the way that optical sciences was set up from a point of view of really being applied research driven, uh, being very entrepreneurial. You know, it, it, is, it is a very cool thing when, you know, when James Webb Space Telescope starts creating these incredible images that are gonna blow everyone's minds. Uh, yeah, we, we had a part of that and that's something to be proud of. And, and the, all the engineers and, and technicians and all the other great people we have here, it's, it's a team effort and, um, and they, they've all had a hand in that, and, and that's something they can all be proud of. And I think, uh, hopefully, uh, it's something uh, that Tucson can be proud of, because, uh, you know, the, the, the university had played a major role in James Webb's Space Telescope. Uh, Jim Wyant was, was on their advisory board for many years, so uh, it definitely would be a, a, a moment for Tucson to be very proud, I think. And, and I think there's just a, a basic thing, uh, a, a basic principle that that optics are going to continue to become to be essential and be even more essential as we develop as we develop new technologies and as we develop new ways of viewing the world. EO does have the, our, uh, I'll say our tagline, the future depends on optics, which it absolutely does. And also our, our present <laughs> relies on optics, our past has relied on optics a lot. Um, so I think a lot of people don't realize how much optical technology underlies a significant amount of their everyday. Um, so a lot of the technology you use from things that right now are as basic as the internet um, enabled by fiber communications, um, things like your cell phone camera that, you know, are pretty ubiquitous. Um, and now we look into the future of robotics and uh, self-driving cars that uses imaging. Um, so there's a lot of places where optics is being used, um, which is really critical to your everyday. Uh, we all need to do international commerce, whether we think about it or not. And access to the sea is what the US Navy is for. 
So keeping the sea lanes clear is a really big deal. And uh, so we're very happy to be able to play a role in that and, and help help enable the, the Navy to do its job, which is to keep us all in business. Lucas and I and all of Optics Valley would like to thank everyone for their time and hope that you have a wonderful International Day of Light celebration this year. For more information, feel free to go to the link above, uh, lightday.org, for all the fun stuff about the International Day of Light. In closing, I would like to thank all the contributors that made this medley of optics and photonics companies in Tucson possible. I hope all of you got as much out of it as Olivia and I had fun putting it together. It reinforced my impression that Tucson is a power player in this industry. I'm looking forward to the next International Day of Light event when we can meet in person and shake hands. I can say is a uh, ditto Lucas again Olivia Lucas and Melissa thank you so much and, and Lucas I can't wait to be in person can't wait to shake people's hands can't wait for next year uh, and yes I think Tucson is such a power player in this industry and it's been so great to, to share that story uh, this evening uh, we are not done yet a, a piece that I have been very much looking forward to uh, of this international day of light is just seconds around the corner, uh, a real treat. We're gonna get to see the art of light with the Rocket Man laser show. So let's get that queued up uh, as our next step here, the Rocket Man laser show by Flandro. amazing. I had to check and make sure I was on mute a few times because I was singing a lot and I figured if I wasn't on mute everyone would be gone by now but I was singing <laughs> I was singing a lot and a great great uh, presentation Flandro and thank you for uh, for your support. Uh, you know when I was asked if I would uh, MC this it uh, it was not a hard decision uh, to say to say yes uh, but one of the thing that things that really excites me is that there's a lot of energy uh, and time and dollars and devotion uh, really being made under the surface uh, here in our region at the University of Arizona around our skill set in optics and space and space technology. And one of my personal goals, one of my personal missions uh, in this community, where, you know, certainly through my radio show and the storytelling platform that is, is I want Tucsonans of all ages, uh, of all backgrounds, when you ask a Tucsonan in three years, five years, 10 years, uh, tell me about Tucson. I want Optics Valley, uh, Space Tech Hub of the Southwest, whatever it may be. I want that to be uh, what is in the, on the tip of our tongues as Tucsonans, as what we know we're good at and the story we tell about ourselves, that should certainly be part of it. And I think it's powerful events like this uh, that help to make that dream a reality. And so again, I'm really honored to have been able to play a small part in this uh, here as your MC. And thank you for allowing me the opportunity to, to be a guide along this journey and certainly Shiloh and the team. Uh, thank you so much for everything uh, that you've done and for you listening and watching. Thank you for joining us uh, today. Uh, one last thank you again to our presenting sponsors, the Flandro Science Center uh, and Planetarium, uh, Optics Valley, <coughs> Uh, SPIE, the International Society for Optics and Photonics, uh, and our, <coughs> excuse me, our gold sponsors, the University of Arizona Bio5 Institute, Edmund Optics, Leonardo, PI, Phys Physic and Instrumente, and Viavi. Uh, thank you so much to our presenting and gold sponsors. And last but not least, the International Day of Light will return on May 16th, 2022. 
Uh, and I will say, Dr. Gruber, I hope it's in person. I believe it will be. I can't wait to shake your hand and others and to see you all in person. Until then, one more time, a round of applause for our organizers, for our sponsors. Thank you guys. Thank you for being with us. To all a good evening. See you around. See you next year uh, and take care. Thank you so much.